Good evening, and welcome to our UECM online classes. This is the second part of the four-part session on the Bible, what it is, and how we got it. My name is Terence Lim, and I'll be serving as your moderator. Tonight, we will have an hour and 15 minutes of lecture and 15 to 20 minutes of question and answer. Our lecturer is Dr. David Andrew Dean. Since Dr. Dean came to BSOP in 1995, he has influenced a generation of godly pastors and missionaries. He and his wife is greatly loved by many of his students and friends, including me and my wife. Uh, before we give this time of lecture to Dr. Dean, we would like to ask Uncle Antonino Lim, our church deacon, uh, to do the opening prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together for the Biblio Bibliology class. We thank you for the speaker, Dr. David Dean. We commit him to your able hands. As he speaks to us, we ask for your presence. Enlighten our minds so that we can be able to comprehend what we are hearing. The Bible is God's infallible word to us. All scripture is God breath, breath out by God through the mouths of, and hands of men. May we always trust and obey every word of God. May we be totally loyal to the word of God. And may God's word govern every area of our lives. We pray in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome back, my brothers and sisters, to our discussion of bibliology, what the Bible is, and how we got it. <clears throat> this is our second session, and our plan for tonight, if we get through it, is to discuss inspiration and inerrancy, two very important doctrines. It'll be next week when we talk about canonization and in the remainder of the course, we'll be talking about the transmission of Scripture and the translation of Scripture. Well, let me give you a brief introduction to the doctrine of inspiration. There are two key passages that we look to in the New Testament in our discussion of inspiration. And the first one is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 to 17. Let me read it to you from the NIV. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And then there's second Peter chapter one, verses 20 to 21. I'll also be reading it to you in the NIV. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. These are two extremely important passages in our discussion of the doctrine of inspiration. Well, let me give you a definition of inspiration to start with. And once I've given you the definition of inspiration, then we're going to go through some theories of inspiration and compare them to this definition which I believe is the correct one. Inspiration is the process by which the Holy Spirit, working through human authors of scripture and employing their individual personalities and personal styles of communication, produced the original autographs, that is the first documents written by the actual biblical authors, which are divinely authoritative and without error and which are the very outbreathed word of God. Now, let me highlight some of the key ideas that we see in this definition. And of course, we'll come back to those two passages that we looked at earlier and remind ourselves how these ideas come out of those passages. The first key idea is this. Inspiration is a process. It's something that happened that brought us the scriptures. Secondly, inspired scripture is the result of that process. 
Next, the autographs, not the authors, are inspired. This is a very, very important concept that uh, many Christians miss. We shouldn't be talking about inspired authors. We should be talking about inspired documents, the autographs, the original books of scripture, because it's the autographs themselves, not the authors, that are inspired. Next idea, the authors are agents of God, but they're not independent agents of God. We don't want to minimize the role of the human writers of scripture, but they didn't do what they did independently without the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Now, the product of inspiration is inspired, that is, God-breathed scripture, which is first and foremost God's word. And you've probably noticed that the word inspired is a little bit of an odd word, and we'll talk about that later. Um, the reason I read the passage to you from the NIV is that the NIV very helpfully translates the key word theopneustos as God breathed, mean, meaning breathed out from the mouth of God. Now, last point is very important. Scripture is God's word delivered through man, not man's word later approved by God. And we'll be coming back to this idea when we uh, work through our discussion and when we talk about inerrancy as well and canonization for that matter. All right, what I wanna do next is to take you through a discussion of, uh, I think there are eight different theories of inspiration which are commonly taught in some seminaries and held by different believers. I would argue that most of them are incorrect or flawed in some way. Let me give you a quick introduction to them. One is called natural inspiration, then partial inspiration, degree inspiration, the neo-Orthodox idea of inspiration, mystical inspiration, conceptual inspiration, dictation or mechanical inspiration, and finally, verbal plenary inspiration. I want to discuss each one of these briefly with you. And as we go through them, I think you'll find that there are serious problems with most of them, but there's value in discussing them because very often learning what something is has to do in part with learning what it is not. And that's one of the reasons for going through these uh, different views. All right, so let's consider each one briefly. All right, first, there is what is called natural inspiration. That's natural inspiration is the idea that inspired scripture is a purely human work, a purely hum human product produced by exceptionally gifted religious thinkers, much like great works of art. Well, how would we evaluate this idea? The first thing that I think we should notice is that according to this theory, there really is nothing divine going on in, in this idea of inspiration. If this were true, um, it would be hard for us to distinguish the Bible, let's say, from any other religious writing. There's no real divine component if this idea were true. It's not unique to the Bible. There are other uh, religious works. There are other major religious books such as the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita, but there are a lot of religious books out in the world. And if those books are just the product of people with a high degree of religious thought, and if the Bible is no different, them, different from them, then the Bible is not really very special. Now, a major problem with this view is that it ignores scripture's own testimony to its origin and its nature and especially to the involvement of the Holy Spirit in the producing of scripture. So I think that the idea of natural inspiration falls far short of a correct understanding of inspiration. Well, our next theory is called partial or dynamic inspiration. This theory says that only doctrinal truths and doctrinal principles in scripture are inspired. On the other hand, Truths that are accessible in human life are from the human authors. This view would say that the doctrines of soteriology, soteriology is the doctrine of how people get saved, 
and many other theological doctrines are free from error. But where the Bible speaks about things like science or origins or history or chronology, uh, there may be errors in the Bible. Now, how would we evaluate this view? Well, what this is really doing is that it's driving a wedge between the human and divine authors. Now, when we talk about scripture, we should be talking about dual authorship. If we take seriously what the Bible says at all, we know that the Holy Spirit was involved in the process of the creation of the books of the Bible. And human beings were the agents of the Holy Spirit. They wrote down those books. Well, if we're going to say that theological ideas in scripture are correct, but ideas that might have to do with things that you could investigate in ordinary life are not correct. We're sort of pulling apart the human and the divine authors and we're saying what the divine author is saying is true, but what the human author is saying may not be true. And that doesn't seem to make much sense. A second big problem with this is that it's hard to come up with any objective criterion to determine what is a doctrinal truth and what falls outside of the area of doctrinal truth. Because uh, the Christian faith and the truths taught in scripture are rooted in events of history. Now the classic event of that, of course, is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that if Christ hasn't really risen from the dead, then our faith is useless and we are still in our sins. You see, we have to take seriously the fact that the resurrection of Jesus is a true event of history. If it's not a true event of history, then there is no value to Christianity. And this kind of a theory of inspiration basically undermines that whole idea. Now, one of the things we're going to be seeing, and I think you can pick this up as we go through our discussion of theories of inspiration, is that many people are approaching the Bible with a certain amount of skepticism regarding its reliability uh, with respect to matters of history or whether miracles really took place, um, those kinds of things. And in a sense, they're trying to save the Bible from alleged errors in the Bible. Now, the classic example of that, of course, is the dispute between the popular theory of Darwinism and the biblical account of creation. And in reality, the two cannot be reconciled. People have tried to reconcile them, but it really doesn't work. Now, there are true believers who hold to Darwinism and they look at the Bible and they say, well, the Bible disagrees with Darwinism. So there must be, there, there are errors in the Bible. How are we going to say that we trust the Bible and yet we reject what the Bible says about origins? Again, this view of inspiration and many others are attempting to save scripture from alleged errors. Otherwise, we would have a complete loss of credibility of the Bible rather than a credible defense. Well, at a certain level, I appreciate that effort, but I don't think that this is the right way to defend ourselves. I think a better way is to take the Bible at face value. And I do believe, and this is a topic for another course, that there is uh, very good reason to reject Darwinism as a bad scientific theory. But let's move on. Next theory of inspiration is called degree inspiration. This theory says that different parts of scripture are inspired in different degrees. Now, people who hold this view would give these kinds of degrees. They would talk about suggestion, direction, elevation, superintendence, guidance and direct revelation. These are different degrees in which the Holy Spirit is, is leading the writers of scripture. People who hold this view would say that there are errors present in scripture, but they would say that scripture is still authoritative for faith and practice. <clears throat> now you may have seen that expression authoritative for faith and practice in the doctrinal statement <clears throat> of your church or some other church. How would we critique this view? Well, pretty much the same criticisms that apply to partial or dynamic inspiration apply to this one. 
And then ask yourself this question, what does partial inspiration mean? Can something be partly God's word? Does God speak half truths? Are there degrees of truth? These things are highly doubtful. Now the next theory of inspiration is the neo-orthodox theory of inspiration. Now, I can't give you the full background for this. Um, it might help you to go listen to our course on prolegomena to get a solid background on the whole concept of neo-orthodoxy if you didn't uh, participate in that course. But according to the neo-orthodox view, the Bible is not really a message from God. It's not propositional rep uh, revelation from God. People who hold this view would say that the Bible is a witness to or a record of people's personal encounters with God. In other words, it's really not a revelation from God. And then the neo-Orthodox theologian typically says this thing, which is really odd. He would say that the Bible becomes a revelation for the individual after he has had his personal encounter with God. So in other words, if I'm not a believer, when I read this Bible, it's not the word of God. But after I come to faith in Christ, it becomes for me the word of God. That's the neo-orthodox idea. Now, how would we evaluate this? Well, this isn't really a theory of inspiration. This is, in fact, a denial of inspiration. Anybody who holds this theory is saying that the Bible is not the word of God. It was not breathed out of the mouth of God. This is essentially a denial of the statement of 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16, um, chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. This view sees revelation as an experience, not a message, which really is nonsense. Um, revelation, the, the very idea of revelation is that it's getting ideas from the mind of God into the minds of people. But if you view revelation as an experience that doesn't contain propositional content, you're really contradicting yourself. You're sort of throwing out the whole idea of revelation. I would also argue that this whole idea is based on a faulty understanding of the nature of revelation and the nature of a relationship with God. We talked about this a little bit last week. We said that according to neo-orthodoxy, you have a personal encounter with God that does not include the transfer of information, and then the Bible becomes God's word. That's the neo-orthodox view. But the biblical view is that the propositional message of scripture certainly including the heart of the gospel. These are ideas that have to come into your mind from the scripture. That propositional message must come into your mind. You must hear it, you must believe it, and then you enter into a personal relationship with God. So it's kind of backwards in neo-orthodoxy. Now let's talk about another view, mystical inspiration. This view says that the human authors were highly gifted religious thinkers with a greater degree, degree of religious insight than other Christians because they were indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Well, this sounds a little bit more like what the Bible says, but it still has problems. First of all, this view still sees scripture largely as a human and natural product, although there is some involvement of the Holy Spirit now, this view allows for the possibility of additional future additions to scripture. It also allows for human error. Now, why does it allow for additional additions, uh, additional, additional additions to scripture? That's redundant. I'm, I'm sorry about that. It's because all Christians are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So according to this view, anybody who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit could produce inspired literature. And that certainly is not the case. Now, what what is a high degree of spiritual insight well in an ordinary man this is not going to produce the word of god man's word is not god's word unless the holy spirit is guiding the process and lastly uh, most of the bible is in the old testament right 80 percent of the bible is old testament but old testament believers weren't indwelt by the holy spirit so this theory 
really falls apart once you start looking at the Old Testament. Well, let's move on to the next theory, the theory of conceptual inspiration. Now pay close attention to this one because this one sounds pretty good at first. This theory says that God gave inspired concepts to humans, the human writers of scripture, who then expressed those concepts in their own sometimes faulty words. This view would say that scripture may contain errant words, but not errant concepts. Well, how would we evaluate this? Well, first of all, if the human expression of divine and true concepts is errant, then we don't have access to the true concepts, right? If, if human beings are a link in a chain from God to the reader of the Bible, if the link in the middle is the human being, and if the human being gets it wrong, then the message is lost. Secondly, um, this view seems to be designed to, to avoid the next theory, which is the dictation theory. And although many people react against the dictation theory, this is worse than what it seeks to avoid or what it seeks to cure. This view also denies that scripture is the word of God. It claims that scripture is man attempting to express the thoughts of God. It's also inconsistent with Isaiah 55 verses 10 through 11. We read those verses last time, and that's where God says that his word that goes forth from his mouth will accomplish the purpose for which he sent it. And obviously, God has given us his word to communicate with us. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. He says that this word is truth. So if it's true that scripture is successful, then this theory cannot be fully correct. Well, now we move on to what's called the dictation or mechanical inspiration theory. This theory says, that God dictated scripture to human authors who wrote down his exact words. In a sense, God is the speaker and the human writers are like stenographers or secretaries writing down exactly what God says. According to this view, obviously, since scripture is God's outbreathed inerrant word, since it comes direct from him, um, this is truly the word of God. Now, the fact of the matter is, there are many portions of scripture which were dictated by God. An awful lot of the Old Testament prophetic books start with this phrase, thus saith the Lord, and then the author writes down God's word, what was revealed to him. Um, but there seems to be a little bit of a problem with this view, right? This view can account for some of scripture, but probably not all of scripture. You know, there are portions of scripture, for example, where Paul is writing to people in a church in another city, and he gives greetings to those people. That doesn't seem to fit this idea. This idea also doesn't really explain variations of style. It doesn't explain personal greetings and histories, things like that. But there is a great strength to this view. This, tr this view gives full recognition of the inspired, inerrant, nature of scripture and it accurately describes the writing of at least some portions of scripture. So there's a lot of value to this view, but it doesn't seem to do the whole job. Well, then we come to what's called verbal plenary inspiration. This theory says that God worked through the human authors of scripture to convey his exact thoughts without error while allowing the human authors freedom of expression according to their own circumstances and styles. Now, let's look carefully at the two words in this definition. Verbal means that God chose the very words that appear in the autographs. In other words, although God was working through the individual authors and through their styles and their vocabularies, he made sure that as he worked through those things, the very words that appear on the page, the grammar, the whole structure, the whole message, is what he wants on the page. The word plenary means that all of scripture is inspired, not just parts of it. 
and certainly that word plenary um, is avoiding the idea that only theological ideas are inspired, but historical ideas or ideas that have a bearing on science or things like that are not inspired. Plenary is pushing that idea off of the table. Now, the strength of this view is that it really is the most sound and biblically accurate theory of inspiration. If we're going to take seriously what the Bible says about itself, this is the best view. So let's consider it in a little bit more detail. Verbal plenary inspiration. Let's go back to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 to 17. And again, I'm reading in the NIV. All scripture is God-breathed. The Greek is literally theopneustos, God-breathed. The idea is that it comes out of the mouth of God. Now, of course, God doesn't have a mouth, right? This is an anthropomorphism. But it's a description that means it is what God says, right? All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This book is the key to equipping us for ministry. Without this, we cannot be thoroughly equipped for ministry. And we need not just to own the Bible, but to read it, to know it, to study it, to obey it, as well as to share it. Now, here are some of the key concepts that come from this passage. First of all, scripture, not the author's, is what is inspired. You see what it says? All scripture is God-breathed. It doesn't say authors are inspired. It says scripture is inspired. And that's one of the big differences between the different theories of inspiration that we looked at. Many of those theories of inspiration said that the authors were inspired in some way, but this text indicates that it is scripture that is inspired. Now, secondly, scripture is useful, right? This means that it's the scripture that has the property, not the authors. You know, the apostles are all dead. We don't need the apostles to come back. We need to read what the apostles and their associates wrote in the New Testament. We need to read what the writers of the Old Testament scripture uh, wrote. It is the scripture that is useful. Now, we'll come back to this in a few minutes. Um, it is linguistically possible to translate the Greek in this sentence as saying something like this, all God-breathed scripture is useful. If we were to go with that kind of a translation, it leaves open the possibility that not all scripture is inspired. However, the structure of the Greek sentence strongly favors the translation that you see on the screen. And I don't know any translation that goes with the other translation. The correct translation is all scripture is God breathed and is useful. Now, the second main text, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 to 21. Peter says, and we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Now, here's the, the key. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. Now, we'll come back to that phrase, prophecy of scripture, in a moment. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Let's look at the key ideas here. First of all, um, in the New Testament, the word prophecy is used in more than one way, and that's actually true in the Old Testament as well. Prophecy can mean predicting the future, predictions of the future, or it can simply mean proclamations of truth. And in, the, in this case here, the phrase prop, prophecy of scripture simply means what scripture proclaims. So Peter is not talking only about the portions of the Bible that we would call prophetic in the sense that they're making predictions of future events. He is basically saying that everything that scripture declares comes from God. 
Now the phrase private interpretation is probably better translated private origin. In other words, scripture is not an expression of the human author's opinion. Scripture is ultimately an expression of truth from the mind of God. Now, according to this passage, God is the initiator and actor, not men in the creation of scripture. Look at that last statement. For prophecy, and again, prophecy here means scripture, for prophecy never had its origin in the will of men. Now, let's stop and think about this. The apostle Paul undoubtedly wrote many other things than the letters that we have in our Bibles. He probably wrote letters to his friends. Um, he may have even re written theological treatises that we don't have. Um, but those things don't have the quality of being inspired. Now, we'll talk about the question of whether what, what it would mean if we found some of Paul's writings later. But it didn't work like this. Paul didn't sit down one day and say, I think I'm going to write some scripture. That's not how it worked. When Paul or any biblical writer wrote something that ended up in our Bible, the Holy Spirit was truly the initiator of that act and the guider of that act. Now, please notice what Peter says. He says that God controlled these men as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, that verb carried along is the Greek word pharaoh. And that verb can be used to describe how a ship is carried along by the sea. And this is a helpful illustration, although it doesn't really tell us everything by any means about how inspiration actually took place. But if you know anything about boating, you know that a captain steers his ship, but his ship is also influenced and driven by the current and the winds. And the, if you're going to use that illustration here, the idea is that God is really controlling the whole process so that as the author writes, what ends up on the page is what God wants to be on that page. Now, here's a table putting all the theories of inspiration on the screen together. And I think this is helpful um, for a comparison. At the top, we've got natural inspiration. At the bottom, we've got verbal plenary inspiration. So the items that are near the top of the list are the ones that are farthest from the correct view and the bottom of the list brings us down to the correct view. Now let's go through the column on the nature of revelation. Is there something that's actually coming from God into the scriptures? Well, the natural theory says nothing is really coming from God. The partial view says that spiritual truths only are coming from the mind of God, but things that aren't purely spiritual are not from God. And the degree view says pretty much the same thing. Now, the neo-Orthodox view says that when the Bible was written, the people who wrote it were just telling about their own experiences. There was no real involvement of the Holy Spirit in that process. The conceptual inspiration theory says that God's thoughts were given to the authors, but not God's words. And it leaves open the possibility that they didn't really get into the Bible. Now, both the dictation view and the verbal plenary view indicate that both the thoughts and the words of God ended up in the scriptures, right? We really get God's thoughts. We really get God's words. And of course, when I say God's words, I don't mean a pile of words in isolation. I mean complete sentences, grammatical sentences that express clear ideas. Now let's look at the column regarding error, starting at the top. The natural, partial, degree, and neo-Orthodox views would also all say that there are many, many errors in the Bible. The mystical inspiration view would say that there are some errors in the Bible. The Bible is correct in spiritual truths, but not in others. The conceptual inspiration view, depending on how hard you might want to push this, might say that there are few errors or there are many errors in the Bible, um, but the dictation and the verbal plenary views would say that there are no errors in the Bible. And that, of course, 
is a topic that we'll come back to when we talk about inerrancy. Now let's look at the column on the means of inspiration. What's going on as a biblical author writes his book? Well, the natural view says that all that's going on is a perfectly natural process. A biblical author is nothing but a really good writer who has some religious ideas. Now the partial and degree inspiration theories don't really explain how it's happening. The neo-Orthodox view says that there really is nothing happening because the Bible isn't from God. Now, the mystical view says that somehow the Holy Spirit is guiding the human author, although there's room for errors to come in. The conceptual view says that the Holy Spirit is guiding by giving correct theological ideas to the human writers, but still leaving how they get onto the page up to the human writer. The dictation view essentially says that the Holy Spirit overwhelms or takes complete charge of the writer. The writer is nothing but a recording instrument. And by the way, there are many portions of the Bible where that is true. Think about the instructions that God gave to Moses in the book of Exodus when Moses was up on the mountain and God is telling Moses exactly how the tabernacle and its furnishings are to be built. I like to imagine Moses up there with a big yellow legal pad and a pile of pencils writing that down to say, what did you say? Pomegranates, golden chains, and he's keeping a record of the things that God says to him. Undoubtedly, that was dictation. Now, the verbal plenary view recognizes that some of the Bible was undoubtedly dictated, but it leaves open the whole question of exactly how God guided the human authors so that what they put on paper was both their word and God's word. The Bible doesn't tell us a lot about how that was done. In fact, the closest thing that I know is what we just read in uh, Second Peter chapter 1, and it's not very detailed. But that doesn't mean that it didn't happen. Now, let's look at the final column on the authority of the Bible. The natural view says that the Bible is sometimes reliable, but it's certainly not inerrant, and the partial and uh, degree views would say the same thing. The neo-orthodox view would say that the Bible only becomes the word of God after you have had your salvation experience. Now, honestly, I don't even know what that means. How can it not be the word of God before you're saved and then be the word of God after you're saved? That makes no sense to me. The mystical inspiration view says that the Bible is authoritative, but not infallible. In other words, you're obligated to obey what the Bible says, but it still might have errors in it. The conceptual theory says that the Bible is infallible, but not inerrant. Um, the dictation view says that the Bible is both infallible and inerrant, and the verbal plenary view says the same thing. Okay, so that's a bit of a review of the different theories of inspiration and a comparison of them. Well, let me give you some concluding thoughts regarding the whole topic and idea of inspiration. First of all, the agent of inspiration is the Holy Spirit. In other words, at the top level, the person controlling the process of the writing of scripture is the Holy Spirit. Now, let me uh, direct you to a couple of verses in the Gospel of John. Okay, John chapter 14, verse 25. These things, this is Jesus speaking, these thing I, things I have spoken to you, to the apostles, while being present with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and will bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Certainly, as we think about the process of the production of the Gospels, the Holy Spirit was clearly involved in enabling the apostles Matthew and John, to recall the things that Jesus had said and done. Now, uh, Mark and Luke were not apostles, but they were associates of the, of the apostles, and they had access to the apostles and their memories of the things that Jesus said and did. Now, next point, the instruments of, human, uh, of inspiration are the human authors. The human authors 
were used by the Holy Spirit, not abused, but used by the Holy Spirit to produce the scriptures. Now, scripture is produced, in other words, by dual authorship. The Holy Spirit is the primary author. The human author is the secondary author. They work together in a cooperative way with the Holy Spirit controlling the process so that what ended up on the page was truly God's word. The object and product of inspiration is the autographs. Now, remember, when we're talking about the Bible, the autographs are the very first documents. For example, for the book of Romans, Paul wrote a letter to the Romans. He sent it to the Romans. They ended up copying it, and it came to be known as the epistle to the Romans or the letter to the Romans. And we have translations of that in our modern English or Chinese Bibles. Now, the beneficiary of inspiration is the human reader. We talked uh, last time about the modalities of revelation. And we said that because God wants us to receive his message, the message that is included in the Bible, God condescended. He came down to our level. He provided revelation to us in a way that we can receive and understand. God invented language. He communicated to us so that we can know him, so that we can come into a, a relationship with him. And lastly, the result of inspiration is divinely true, authoritative, inerrant scripture. Now, we haven't talked much about inerrancy yet, but I think you can see, just with a little bit of thought, that if this Bible really is the word of God, then it's not just from God, it must also be true. Now let's talk about the extent of inspiration. This is an important point. How far does inspiration go? Here are the key questions that we need to address. To what does scripture refer in 2 Timothy 3.16? What is that word referring to? Secondly, are both the New Testament and the Old Testament inspired? Third, does inspiration extend to words, to letters, or to punctuation? Let's tackle these one by one. Okay, this is the Greek text of 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. And I'm not going to read it to you right now because our time is short. But there's a phrase in here, pasa grafe theopneustas kai ophelimas. This could be translated as all scripture is God breathed and is useful. That's the way it is uniformly translated in every Bible that I know. Another possible, another grammatically possible translation would be all God breathed scripture is also useful. If this were the correct translation, it might suggest that only portions of the Bible are God breathed. However, anybody who has studied Greek will know that this translation, the first one, fits the pattern of 1 Timothy chapter 4.4. 4. It's exactly the same structure. And therefore, I don't think there's any question that the statement is, all scripture is God breathed. Well, then the question is, what was Paul referring to when he spoke of scripture? Okay, now let me look at that text and give you a bit more context. Paul says to Timothy in verse 14, but as for you, continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of knowing from whom you have learned them and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in christ jesus and then paul says all scripture is god breathed so it's obvious that when paul made this statement he had the old testament scriptures in mind it was the old testament that timothy had learned from his childhood the new testament was not in existence when timothy was a child Nonetheless, several considerations suggest that the statement of 2 Timothy 3.16 is applicable to the New Testament as well. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18, Paul refers to Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4, and a quotation from the Gospel of Luke, and he calls them both scripture. So he's identifying both the Old Testament and the New Testament as scripture. 
Now in 2 Peter 3.16, Peter calls Paul's writings scripture. Um, let me read to you from 2 Peter chapter 3, starting with verse 14. Peter says, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some that are hard to understand, which those who are untaught and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do also to the rest of the scriptures. So Peter is identifying Paul's writings as scripture. Now the statement that I just read to you is in the same book as 2 Peter 1 verses 20 to 21, where Peter talks about the Holy Spirit carrying the human writers along. So he is saying that Paul's writings are inspired. Now, when Paul wrote 2 Timothy 3.16, most of the New Testament was already written. The books that probably weren't written at this time were 2 Peter, the book of Hebrews, Jude, John's Gospel, and 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and, and the book of Revelation. But other than that, most of the New Testament was already written. And we just read John 14, 26, where Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would enable the apostles to recall what they had been taught by him. That is supernatural enablement. It's exactly the kind of thing that 2 Peter chapter 1 is speaking of. So I think it's a reasonable conclusion that the word scripture that Paul uses in 2 Timothy 3.16 refers to both the New Testament and the Old Testament. That would indicate that the answer to our second question is that both the Old Testament and the New Testament are inspired. Now we'll come back to this question a little bit when we talk about canonization next week. Now, our third question, does inspiration extend to words, to letters, to punctuation? Well, the evidence of scripture indicates that even the words and letters of scripture are inspired. I'm, I'm going to go through this a bit quickly, but I think you can follow with me. All right? Jesus cites Exodus chapter 3, 16, and he emphasizes the tense of the verb. Um, Matthew 22, verse 32. I think we should read that. Jesus is speaking to the Sadducees, and in verse 31, this is what he says. He says, but concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? Now, that's a quotation from Exodus chapter 3, where Moses is having a conversation with God at the burning bush. Jesus says, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Now, he's building that entire um, argument on the statement where God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still alive, even though they have died in their mortal, mortal bodies, their spirits are still alive. So Jesus is building that whole argument on the tense of a verb. Then Jesus is having a dispute in the same chapter with the Pharisees. And he brings up Psalm 110, verse 1, where David, writing, says, The Lord said to my Lord, or more specifically, Yahweh, the God of Israel, said to the Messiah. Now, the whole argument is built on a single word, that second word, Lord. Uh, David is calling his future descendant, the Messiah, his master. Now, that's a key argument based on a single word, All right? In Matthew 5, 18, Jesus says, not one jot or one tittle of the scripture will pass away until all of scripture is fulfilled. Now, jots and tittles are tiny letters in the Hebrew language. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, Paul says that God spoke in words which the Holy Spirit teaches, and he's referring there 
to the process of the creating of scripture. In Jeremiah chapter 26, verse 2, after Jeremiah's uh, writings are cut up and burned by the king, he is instructed to rewrite them and not to omit a word of what he was told to say and write down. In Revelation chapter 22, John pronounces a divine curse on anyone who would change or remove the words of this prophecy. So the conclusion is that the very words and even letters of the scripture are inspired. In other words, the words and letters that ended up on the page of the autographs are the exact ones that the Holy Spirit wanted to end up there. But what about punctuation? There are a number of things that are not inspired in scripture. Some things in our Bibles are not inspired. First of all, punctuation is not inspired. There was no punctuation in either the Hebrew or the Greek autographs. Capitalization is not inspired. Neither ancient Hebrew nor ancient Greek used capital letters in the way that we do. For example, when you're reading in your Bible, you often see pronouns that refer to God capitalized. Well, there's a possibility that the translator was mistaken with regard to who that pronoun refers to. So sometimes when you're reading in your Bible, if you see the word he with a capital H in front of it, it might not actually refer to God, even though the translator is suggesting that it, it does. How do you answer that question? You look at the context. Now, vowels were not part of the original Hebrew texts. They were added much later. There's always the possibility that the, owl, the vowels that were added later could possibly be wrong. And in some cases, that might change the meaning of a word slightly. Now, word separation in Greek is not original. When the New Testament uh, writings were written, they didn't put spaces between words. So occasionally, that could lead to a confusion. For example, if I were to write on the screen, have you ever seen a carrot? There would be a space uh, between seen and the word carrot. If I were to write it in Greek, it would all be following letters with no space. And you could divide that sentence differently. You could divide it, have you ever seen a car rot? Now, a mistake like that is a very rare thing because usually you can't divide words in different ways, but that's an occasional possibility where there might be some confusion in reading the original Greek. And certainly chapter and verse divisions are not inspired. These were supplied by modern translators and they're usually well done, but we should never assume that they are inspired. And sometimes the chapter breaks in our Bibles don't really come at the best places. Now, let me offer you uh, some of the objections that people will often raise when we talk about inspiration. They will say something like this, since there are errors in the Bible, there's no way that it can be God's word. How would we respond? Well, the fact is that no archeological or historical discovery has ever proved the presence of error in the Bible. In fact, archeology span and history are constantly affirming the truth of the Bible. A second objection, fallible humans could never produce an inerrant Bible. Well, this is just silly. Fallible humans produce all kinds of inerrant works. We produce computer programs with error, without error. We produce mathematical treatises without error. And certainly when God is guiding the process, it is possible to produce books without error. Now, this objection is sometimes tied to skepticism about God's ability to communicate with man. But since God is the inventor of communication, that again is silly. A third objection. Since we can't understand how inspiration occurred, it can't be true. Well, stop and think about this. When people didn't understand how rain worked, it still rained. We don't know how birds navigate across oceans without getting lost, but they do it. Our lack of understanding of something doesn't make it impossible. A fourth objection, the truths of God cannot be conveyed in human language. Well, again, 
if God wants to communicate with us, if God is the inventor of language, and he is, um, he has made this possible. Language may not be able to communicate truths about God exhaustively, but language can provide to us an adequate and accurate message. We don't know everything about God. The Bible doesn't reveal everything about God, not even close, but it reveals what we need to know. God has given us what we need to know in the Bible. Now, the last objection is this. God would not force people to write so that their word is his word. Well, this objection assumes that God's sovereignty and human free will are mutually exclusive. But the fact of the matter is that the Bible teaches that both are true. The Bible teaches that we are free and responsible for our decisions. And it also teaches that God works through our free choices to unfold his plan for the ages. God is in control, yet man makes his own choices. And by the way, I don't think that if you were to talk the, to the Apostle Paul, he would complain about the fact that God had used him to produce uh, scripture. I don't think any biblical writer would complain about that. I think that they would say that they were honored to have participated in that process. Let's look at a comparison of incarnation and inspiration. This is from Paul N's The Moody Handbook of Theology. When we're talking about inspiration, God starts with divine truths. They're penned by human authors as the Holy Spirit superintends the process. This event is called inspiration, and the result is the living written word, the living and active word of God. Now, in the incarnation, the pre-incarnate Christ was born of a human mother as she was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit causing her to conceive. This is the event known as the incarnation. The result was the living incarnate word. Now there's an interesting comparison between them. The living written word is without error and the living incarnate word is without sin. I think this is a helpful comparison. Well, let's move now to the topic of inerrancy. We've got about 15 minutes left and I think we can cover this topic in the time that we have. Inerrancy is a corollary to inspiration. A corollary is an idea that naturally flows from another idea. Inspiration, the idea that the Bible is true and without error in the original autographs follows naturally from the doctrine of inspiration. Charles Ryrie, a theologian who's now with the Lord stated it this way. He said that God is true. In other words, God is a truth teller. God breathed out the Bible and therefore the Bible is true. This is a pretty simple syllogism. Now, once again, let's survey the range of views on inerrancy to clarify the significance of this important doctrine, All right? And we're gonna go in the other direction this time. This time we're gonna start with the correct view and move toward less correct views. And with each view, we're going to ask the question, what in the Bible is without error? What in the Bible contains error? And then we'll look at additional particulars. Now, according to absolute inerrancy, everything in the Bible, including scientific statements is true. Nothing in the Bible contains error. In other words, the biblical authors meant to reveal scientific truths as well as history and doctrine. Now, this view is fully compatible with the scripture's own teaching. Now, let's look at the second view, full inerrancy. I think this is a better statement, really, of the same ideas. Full inerrancy says that everything in the Bible is true, although the Bible often uses phenomenological language and approximations. For example, when you're reading the Gospels, uh, the gospel writers will talk about times of day and they might talk about the first or the third hour of the morning. They're not giving times down to minutes and seconds. The Bible talks about the sun rising and the sun setting. Well, we all know that the sun doesn't really rise nor does it set, the earth rotates. That's phenomenological language, but we all use it. This view says that nothing in the Bible contains error. Now this view takes note of human conventions it notes that things 
may come in various degrees of accuracy, but it allows no error in the use of those conventions. All right, this view is fully compatible with scripture's own teaching. And I think this is the best formulation of inerrancy. Now, a third view is called limited inerrancy. Limited inerrancy says that all non-empirical matters, things that you can't investigate through the use of science, for example, all non-empirical matters related to salvation are true. What in the Bible contains error? Well, this view would say that scientific and historical references may show the errant ideas of the writers in their own time. This view says that God revealed only spiritual truths, not science or history, which really are not essential to the Bible's purpose. Now, there are many Christians who hold a view something like this, but ultimately I think this view is self-defeating. When you draw a distinction between doctrinal truth and historic or scientific truth, this really breaks down in practice. Remember, um, Christianity is a historic religion. It's built on history and scientifically meaningful events such as the creation, the flood, the uh, miracles of the Exodus, the miracles of Jesus's ministry, and certainly the greatest miracle of all, the resurrection of Jesus. If those things are not scientifically true, then our faith is worthless. Another view, purpose inerrancy. Purpose inerrancy says that what, what, with regard to the question, what in the Bible is without error? This says that the Bible effectively accomplishes its purpose to bring men into saving fellowship with Christ. This view would say that there are errors present in the Bible. They're numerous in scientific and historical matters. And it would add that inerrancy does not equal factuality, only effectiveness of purpose. In other words, the Bible accomplishes its purpose of getting people saved but we can't really believe the uh, peripheral things that have nothing to do with soteriology. Well, this may sound good, but again, it's impossible to reliably convey truth through error, especially when the reader doesn't know where the errors lie. I mean, somebody might say, well, we don't have to believe the creation story, but we believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Well, why do you say it's okay not to believe the creation story, but you say it's absolutely not okay to reject the resurrection? There's no real criterion upon which to make that kind of a decision. Ultimately, this is a self-defeating viewpoint. Now, another view is called accommodated revelation. This view says that the biblical writers adapted their teaching to, or in some cases agreed with, the false beliefs of their audiences. The classic example of this would be where a gospel writer um, talks about a person being demonized and the demon throws the child into the fire or into the water. But the modern reader would say, well, that really wasn't a demon. It was the uh, physical neurological disease of epilepsy. This view says that there's very little in the Bible that's without error. What in the Bible contains error? Well, this view would say that even Jesus and Paul show errors in their thinking and changes of mind and change of, changes of ideas. This view says that the Bible is not reliable either in factual or spiritual matters, but it must in all points be subject to human evaluation. Well, this is driving us back to empiricism that we talked about in our course on prolegomena. How would we respond to this? Well, Jesus certainly did not accommodate his teachings to the false ideas and misconceptions of his audience. He insisted that scripture was true down to the very letter. There's no way that you can hold this view and take seriously um, Jesus's own statements. Then there is the neo-Orthodox view of non-propositional inerrancy. This view says that when you ask the question, what in the Bible is without error, the question is wrong. When you ask what in the Bible contains error, the question is wrong. Why? Because this view says the Bible is not a propositional revelation at all. It's rather a pointer to a personal encounter with God, or to put it another way, it's a record of other people's experiences with God. 
This is just the old neo-orthodox idea. It's a failed attempt really to bypass the issues of inspiration and inerrancy. Now, people who want to hold this view seem to want to say, well, I can believe the saving message of the Bible, but I can throw out the truth of everything else. It really doesn't work. If you try to hold this view, you are ultimately undermining yourself. All right, here's another view. This view simply says that inerrancy is impractical. When you ask what in the Bible is without error, you can't answer that question. When you ask what in the Bible contains error, you can't answer that question. Why? People who hold this view say that since we don't have the autographs, the doctrine of, in, in, of inerrancy has no practical importance because we don't have the originals. Well, how do we respond to this? The answer is that even though we don't have the autographs, their absence does not render inerrancy useless because lower criticism, which we'll talk about later in the course, has shown us that the copies that we have are highly accurate reproductions of the originals. Now, an eighth view says that inerrancy is unhistorical. When you ask the question, what is in the Bible? What in the Bible is without error or what in the Bible contains error? You shouldn't ask the question because the early church never cared about inerrancy. So we shouldn't care either. Well, this is simply false. The early church did believe in inerrancy. Christ and the other biblical writers taught it. Ancient theologians plainly believed it. Again, Paul says that if the resurrection is not a fact of history, our faith is worthless. This is just a silly objection or a silly idea. And the last one, I believe, is the idea that inerrancy is irrelevant. When you ask the question, what in the Bible is without error? What in the Bible contains error? The answer, according to this view, is that both of these questions are irrelevant. People who hold this view would add that inerrancy is not a biblical concept. Biblical authors weren't concerned with truth. And then they throw this last thing in. Inerrancy divides the church. Now, this is a very practical issue, and it's one of the reasons why we're giving this course. Right? The fact is that the Bible does teach inerrancy by implication. The Bible says that it is inspired, and if it is inspired, it is inerrant. And as we've said again and again, biblical authors were concerned about truth. Now, it may be true that differing views on inerrancy may divide the church, but if that is the case, the problem is with the church, not with the doctrine of inerrancy, right? If, if, if I find it difficult to have fellowship, for example, with a person who says, I don't believe that the Bible is inspired, I don't believe that the Bible is inerrant, and he says he doesn't want to have fellowship with me because I do believe that the Bible is inspired and the Bible is inerrant. The problem is not with those doctrines. The problem is with us. One of us is wrong. And I would argue that the person who rejects inspiration and inerrancy is wrong. The problem is not with the doctrine. The problem is with the church. And we need to get ourselves on the right side of this issue. Now, Quickly, some defenses of inerrancy. There is the deductive proof that moves from generalities to specifics. This kind of proof is conclusive if its premises are correct. And we've seen this already. God speaks truth. The Bible is God's speech. Therefore, the Bible is true and inerrant. I think this is a very strong argument. Then there is, of course, the possibility of an inductive proof. Now, an inductive proof moves from specifics to general conclusions. And inductive proofs are not absolutely conclusive, but they are helpful. Now, suppose that we could examine all the teachings of the Bible. Suppose that we could demonstrate that they're all accurate. Now, this is very hard to do and probably impossible. If we could do those things, then if we could demonstrate that there are no errors in scripture, the inerrancy of scripture would be proven. However, um, practically speaking, the absence of any convincing disproof of scripture after centuries of study and centuries of efforts to disprove the Bible argues strongly 
for the reliability, for the inspiration and inerrancy of scripture. Now, there may still be some problem passages, but unless we run into an inescapable logical contradiction, and we never have, we have every reason to remain confident in the reliability of scripture. Okay. Now, let me point out that it's more difficult for a believer to hold to an errantist position than to an inerrancy position. Think about this. People who say that the Bible contains error claim that error can teach truth. But this is not true in the case of the Bible because it claims to present absolute truths which cannot be verified without the aid of the Bible itself. The Bible talks about metaphysical realities. The Bible tells us about the nature of God. The Bible tells us things which we cannot learn by experiment. We cannot learn by science. If you throw out the idea that the Bible is true, those truths are simply inaccessible and the gospel becomes meaningless and inaccessible. Now, any claim that the Bible contains error ends up impugning God's character. If we say that the Bible is God's word and it contains error, we're really calling God a liar. And a third point, practically speaking, people who say that the Bible contains errors really don't agree on where the alleged errors are to be found in the Bible. So let me give you some final observations on inerrancy. Inerrancy applies to what the Bible asserts, not what it reports. In other words, there is a statement in the Bible, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Well, that's the Bible telling what the fool says. It's not the Bible expressing that there is no God. Secondly, passages must be interpreted by sound hermeneutical methods. We need to take account of conventions of communication which often differ in different parts of the Bible. Statements in the Bible need to be accurate, but they don't have to be precise to some arbitrary level. Furthermore, historical accounts may sometimes be arranged by topic, not by time. Fourthly, inerrancy allows for variations of style, vocabulary, and even grammar. And theological terms are sometimes used differently by different writers in different contexts. Inerrancy allows for varied but not contradictory reports of the same events. That's why we can compare the Gospels to get a clearer picture of some of the things that happened in the life of Christ. Inerrancy does not require verbatim reporting of dialogue. Inerrancy allows for unconventional grammar and syntax when this suits the author's purpose. Inerrancy is not disproved when we have difficulty on understanding problem passages, but inerrancy does demand that any given account not teach error and not contain un unreconcilable differences with other accounts. Now I have one more slide and then we can move on to our questions and answers. Some practical implications of inerrancy. We can and we should approach the Bible with confidence that it's reliable and trustworthy. When we study the Bible, we should employ our confidence in its truthfulness and internal consistency. And that means we should use what we discussed last time, the principle of progressive revelation and the analogy of scripture. Thirdly, God's word is authoritative. That means we are obligated by our responsibility to him to seek to understand it and obey it. Fourthly, the fact that God has given us an inspired and inerrant Bible, this incredibly precious thing, is another reason to worship and thank him. All right, I'm ready for a time of questions and answers. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Dean. I have several questions, and I have we have received some questions from our participants. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the questions that I have written down, uh, you have asked it, and you said you, you're going to be answering it later on, is um, when we say inerrancy of the autographs, uh, we are referring to the original autographs. So how are we certain that the Bible we have today is the inerrant word of God when we do not have the original autograph? So, sir, are you answering that question later on? 
let, let me briefly address it and we'll come back to it next week. Okay. Uh, the quick answer is this. Um, we have many manuscripts of both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And for various reasons that we will discuss next week, we have very strong reasons to be highly confident that the copies that we have today contain the original readings and that it's possible uh, to know the correct readings of the originals. The other thing that I will point out very briefly is that the Bible is a big book. This is a big book. It's got a lot of information in it and it has redundant, excuse me, redundant information in it. And it may be the case that there are a few places where we're not exactly sure what the original text says, but God has given sufficient redundancy that even if there might be a few of those places, uh, we have not lost essential information. I'll stop with that because we'll come back to this next week when we talk about textual criticism. Okay, I, I'll ask again next week uh, okay. so that we, we will be reminded of that answer. Um, mm -hmm. Another question is, uh, when, we, when you talk about the inspiration, you, you mentioned of the, the uh, dictation view and the verbal plenary view of inspiration. Um, mm -hmm. are, are, do you mean that we accept both views as uh, Christian Orthodox views on inspiration or, okay. or just the verb, verbal plenary? Okay, good question. Uh, and I, I'm glad you asked this because this is an important clarification. This is what I would say. I would say that the verbal plenary view is the expression of inspiration that covers all the bases. Now, the dictation theory is essentially describing a way a portion of the Bible was created, but not all of the Bible. So I would say that the verbal plenary view allows for the dictation view in the cases where it applies. And there are a number of places in the Bible where it applies. Now, let me, let me read um, from 1 Peter chapter 1. A very interesting statement by Peter regarding scripture. Starting in verse 10, of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. Who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which have now been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. Now, if you think, think through what Peter has just said, here's what he's saying. He's saying that in many cases, the writers of scripture did not understand the full meaning of what they themselves wrote. Let me read it again. They searched diligently, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. So this, this has some bearing on the whole question of uh, dictation. There were times when the biblical writers wrote down things and they said, we don't understand them. Certainly uh, Daniel did that in his book. He said, I've got this prophecy. I have no idea what it means. And so in cases like that, I think it's pretty clear that there was something like dictation going on. And there are many cases in scripture where there was clear dictation going on. But to, to go back to the question, verbal plenary inspiration is that covers all the bases and it leaves room for the fact that some of scripture was dictated. Yeah, thank you, sir, for clarifying, because I, I think that's the biggest difference between how we understand our Christian view of the scripture inspiration to how Muslim view of their Quran. Uh, it's mm. primarily a dictation from God, right? So uh, here, here uh, there, there are some questions from our participant. Uh, here are some of them. I heard a skeptic say people made up scriptures for the purpose of keeping their society in order. So they had an ulterior motive to benefit their community. How would you respond? 
Okay, yeah, I, I like that question. Um, I guess the first way that I would respond to that is simply to speak of my own experience when I began reading the Bible before I was a believer. One of the things that struck me about the Bible was that it was very honest in the sense that it spoke of human sinfulness. And the other thing that struck me is I cannot think of any good reason why human beings would write this book. This book is not flattering to the human race. Um, this book calls for a standard of life, which is way beyond anything that any being, any human being would want to place upon himself. Um, now, God doesn't expect believers to live sinless lives, but God does call us to do our best by the power of the Holy Spirit and the guidance of the word and through the encouragement of other believers to seek to imitate Christ. We're called to view him as the standard of godliness. Um, I don't think that any human being could possibly have, for example, um, put together a book like this. Now, th there is absolutely no question that the books of the Bible cover a long span of time in writing. They were written over a long span of centuries, and even the greatest skeptic has no choice but to admit that the Old Testament was completed at the very, very latest by around 250 BC, right? The last book of the Bible to be written was the book of Revelation around 96 AD. Now, almost everybody will agree that the Bible is much older than 250 AD, but even a book from 250 AD to around, I'm sorry, 250 BC to around 150, uh, 100 AD, that's 250 years. How anybody could produce a book with so much variation and yet so much internal consistency in that period, to do that humanly is, is beyond possibility. Furthermore, and I haven't talked about that yet, yet in this course, the fact that the Bible contains fulfilled prophecy is an enormous proof of its miraculous nature. So I don't think that that argument that people invented the Bible to create an orderly society really stands up to close scrutiny. I've heard this idea before, and I think it's a good question, but I think anybody using a little common sense will say that that just doesn't work. Uh, yeah, Next thank question. Thank you, sir. Um, yeah, a while ago, you talked about the Gospels where the different Gospels writers yeah. talks about uh, a probably a similar events with different perspective. Uh, here's one mm -hmm. question that relates to that. It says, Matthew says they are they were two demoniacs in Gerasenes, uh, uh, but Mark mm -hmm. and Luke says they are only one. How do we explain these differences? Sure. Well, I guess the answer to the question is that it's not really true that Mark and Luke say there was only one. Mark and Luke only refer to one. So. Um, as let, let's suppose we were looking at multiple newspaper accounts of a particular event, let's say a car crash, and one newspaper reports two car crashes in a certain location on one day and one only reports one. It doesn't mean that the one that only reported one is in error. It just means that it's not as complete as the other. So I think that that's really sufficient explanation for what's going on here. Um, uh, is it Luke and Mark that only report one? Is that correct? Yep. Uh, yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. I, I don't think either one of them says that there is only one. They simply report on just one. So, yep. That's my answer. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Um, sir, this question, uh, I, we, I have two more questions. Uh, before we end, uh, this one question, uh, you may choose to answer it later in our last, uh, uh, succeeding sessions. 
our mm -hmm. variants, you know, because we have a lot of manuscripts, copied manuscripts, yeah. our variants in the manuscripts convey that the Bible has errors. Okay. Well, obviously, uh, if we're talking about variants in copies of the autographs, those variants don't mean that there's error in the Bible because the doctrine of inspiration technically only applies to the autographs. However, variants in copies do raise the question of whether we know what the autographs said accurately. And that's a topic for uh, textual or lower criticism. And we'll talk about it next week. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, there are several more questions. Uh, I think it's more related to not the entire bibli bibliology or the issue of inerrancy and inspiration, but more of uh, how we understand the scripture, like who wrote the book of Job, or how do you use, harmonize or understand certain things in the book of Acts. Uh, mm. Would you like to answer those questions, sir? I'm willing, to give it a try. I'm willing to give it a try, sure. Okay, who wrote the book of Job? I have no idea. I have no idea. Um, th there are a lot of ideas floating around, but I don't know. I don't know. All I can say is um, the people of Israel were convinced that it is the word of God, and I think that they were right. I think we'll get to heaven someday and we'll ask, but I don't know who wrote the book of Job. I, I'm not even sure we know when it was written. It may it may actually predate the books of Moses, but those are those are questions for which we don't have answers. We, we are just sure that it is an inspired word of God. Yes. Okay. Um, just one last question. Again, it's related okay. to more of the scripture rather than the scripture itself. You know. uh, mm -hmm. It says in Acts 15, chapter 15, verse 20, it says we shouldn't eat anything with blood. I think this is, mm. this is a question that you would love. Uh, yes. Should we today avoid blood pudding? or rare steak, uh, <laughs> this has always been in my conscience. Okay, um, boy, do I have 10 minutes to answer this question? <laughs> no, you don't, sir, <laughs> Okay, have a few minutes. All right, I'll just give you a few minutes. This, this is an important question because when uh, Reverend Terrence Lim, who I'm speaking to, was my student, this issue came up very early after our arrival in the Philippines. Okay, the quick answer to the question is that the prohibition against eating blood is given to all of mankind in Genesis chapter nine. Now, the Levitical laws repeat the prohibition against eating blood, but that is not where the prohibition comes from. The fact of the matter is that food is defined by God. Food is not things that you can eat that will nourish you. Food is what is defined by God. So in Genesis chapter 9, um, God widened the category of food. Before the flood, the only thing that people ate was plants. After the flood, God gave mankind permission to eat meat, but he instructed that before meat was to be eaten, it should be bled. That means that no one should intentionally take blood and eat it. That means that dinaguan is a food that no person should eat and certainly no Christian. And it has nothing to do with Judaism. Now to the question of eating rare steak, any steak that you buy in a proper butcher shop will have been bled. There is a small amount of blood that remains in the meat. It's impossible to get it out. God understands that. And whether you cook your steak until it's as tough as shoe leather or you eat it raw, there's no more or no less blood in it. So you should feel very comfortable eating your steak rare if you like it, but you should stop eating dinaguan and blood sausage and things like that because that's intentionally eating blood, which God has forbid us to do. And, and Acts chapter 15 repeats those regulations and it's not a compromise between the Gentiles and the Jews. It's going back to the fundamental regulations that apply to the whole human race. That's my quick answer.
Okay, thank you, sir, for uh, sharing that answer. Uh, we are just testing you at that time, sir, uh, whether you are <laughs> following the scripture or not. Good. Okay, thank you for, for your time. Uh, that. We would like to close this session. I uh, hope you enjoy our study. Uh, before we end, we would like to ask our brother, Miguel Bati, to close us with a word of prayer. Okay, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we once again thank you for giving us this opportunity to have fellowship with our brothers and sisters. We also thank you for uh, revealing yourself and your truths uh, through the Bible. Father, we also would like to thank you for using your servant, Dr. David Dean, for teaching us your word. May you continue to bless him and his family, and may you continue to use him for your glory. Father, we also pray that you help us remember what we learned tonight, not only in our minds, but especially in our hearts. May your Holy Spirit always strengthen us, Lord, and lead us to live our lives pleasing to you, so that when people look at us, they see you. Father, once again, we would like to thank you and commit to you the rest of the night. This we pray through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, everybody, and have a blessed night. Good night to everyone.